Hi everyone, welcome back to another episode of Humans of Western. This is the Voices of Western podcast and I'm your host Hussein. Today I'm joined by another one of our alumni, Juanita Lee Garcia. She has been one of the people who I met last year at Venture for Canada and an amazing support team member, mentor that I can always count on. Um, she pursued multiple degrees at Queens, Western, and U of T, which we'll be talking about. But the high-level overview is that she started her career at retail sales and slowly transitioned to community focus and impact-driven roles um, at organizations like Venture for Canada and more recently as an executive director at the Upside Foundation of Canada, which is like they are doing a super cool thing for entrepreneurship and Canada, and we'll be talking more about that. Uh, Juanita, I will be passing it on to you. Hi. It's Hi. nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for being here. Um, so I gave a very brief introduction about yourself. Would you like to add anything, perhaps take us through your story? Yeah, sure. Um, so my pronouns are she, her, and it's uh, great to see you doing this work, Hussein. Um, I'm calling in from Toronto. That's where I'm based out of. Originally, I am from Colombia. So I immigrated to Canada in 2007 with my family, which is where, um, to Ottawa, which is where I did my last two years of high school, but ended up doing my undergrad at Queens. I know that I think there's still the Queens Western rivalry going on at the undergraduate level, but Western has a really special place in my heart. I went to graduate school at Western in the Faculty of Visual Arts and did a master's in fine arts. I was also able to teach at the university and had some incredible students from across multiple departments. My course was a non-writing course, and I got to meet a lot of international students and a lot of students from the business school that were looking to take a creative course as well, in addition to the regular course load. I had students from first to fourth year that were also able to take my course. So was able to connect with a range of students from across the Western community. That's a little bit about me. Awesome. And then was it at the same time? So you did your undergrad at Queens. What made you decide to, you know, pursue a higher education and specifically at Western, given the you know, the rivalry <laughs> between the two. Um, well, I mean, Western is an excellent school. They're both excellent schools. And uh, when I, gr- I never went to university to get a job. Uh, when I started my undergraduate degree in 2010, I went into a program to do something that I was passionate about, that I was interested in and was good at, which I know not a lot of folks have have the privilege to to do so from uh, a cultural standpoint. Some folks end up being pressured potentially by parents or by society or, or even by themselves to go into a degree or a faculty that they think that they're supposed to be in, whether that's business or engineering or uh, something that isn't in the in the arts or even in the arts, if they have a parent who's had a job in a specific field, um, it's very common for young people in Canada to pursue uh, things that they have had contact with um, and have uh, had examples in their lives. And also, um, you know, I came from Ottawa, so a lot of folks went into politics, um, but I didn't do that. I uh, had the privilege of choosing what I what I went to school for, uh, but also in some ways uh, the setback. I put myself through school and I paid for all of my schooling. And so I wanted to do that for myself, but I also, so I wanted to study art because I, I loved it. And I was really interested in both like art history and conceptual art and, and making art. Um, but that meant I needed jobs that would part-time jobs while I was in school that would also pay quite well. So at the time when my friends were doing internships at banks, uh, as tellers, or they were doing internships in government, um, I had already been working in retail for a long time. I started working for Aritzia when I was in high school and my part-time hourly wage at the time was way higher than what internships offered. So because I was putting myself through school, 
and paying for school, it didn't make sense for me to, to leave a really good job that was high paying, that I had a lot of, um, you know, access to with, in terms of scheduling and when I wanted to work and going home for the holidays early. So I would, you know, take courses that exams ended early, and then I would be able to work for a month in December and similar with summer and end of term. And so I didn't really get that like professional work experience, but that being said, um, I think that's a really antiquated mindset. You can gain a lot of skills wherever you work. And while I was at Aritzia, I gained a multitude of business acumen skills from people management to sales forecasting to um, world-class customer service. And I was able to really make a career in retail sales while I was there. Um, but also knowing that I had this dual career in academia because that's what I was interested in. I was interested in teaching art at the higher level. Um, I was interested in being part of a university at the time. And so graduate school really felt like that natural next step for me. I um, applied to Western because I had an incredible faculty with some very exciting artists at the time that I wanted to work with and learn from. It also uh, felt very familiar to me. Like it was very similar to that university town feel that was like really focused. I don't have a lot of attention span. And so I felt that if I had gone to a larger city, whether that was in the US or even Vancouver or Montreal, I would get too distracted by the things that the city has to offer. And so I also had a partner at the time who had gone into Western and it just felt like a very natural fit for us to go to graduate school together after uh, finishing our undergrad. Awesome. So I, I already have a few questions to ask. Um, one of them is about, you know, so you did your degree, you didn't do it to get a job, right? That's, uh, if that's what I'm hearing correctly, you did it because you were passionate about it. Given that you were working at retail sales at the time, um, why bother do a master's degree in the thing that you're just passionate about if you're already earning money? Because the path for most people is I will get a degree that can pay me well. Yeah, I mean, I understand higher education at the you know socioeconomic level that it it's never really meant to get you a job. Uh, I understand things like how like the industrial revolution and, and like a knowledge economy have created our kind of social pathways. And so for me, making money and getting a degree went goes hand in hand, but not for the short term results. So not for the immediate results. Um, long-term, I think it's really important. And I do think those things correlate, like having a degree in an area or building expertise in an area and then growing in your field. But I knew that I was seeing patterns of people going to school and then having to get jobs and random things that were very irrelevant to their studies. So especially after the, the 2008 recession, right? So the 2008 recession really kind of shifted the way in which people like entered the, the job market. And sh in the short term, I didn't see my degrees being immediately correlated to my avenues of making money. Um, I also knew that I didn't want to work in retail forever. So even though I was making really good money, working in retail, managing a store, uh, in a, in a Canadian company that had a really interesting compensation model, I knew that that's not what I wanted to do in the long term. And so I had to start building my like toolbox and equipping myself for like the longer term outlook. Um, one of the things that is important for me uh, in, in the field that I'm in and also in the field that I was in in the art world is that you're often not recognized as an expert or as a practicing artist or as um, having the legitimacy in your space without having that graduate degree. And so an MFA is a terminal degree, unlike other degrees that um, you, you require like a PhD to get into like that expertise level. Um, now there are more PhDs in visual arts, but an MFA was considered a terminal degree at the time. 
And I knew that in the long term, also for my own art practice, having that in my toolbox, having that experience, learning from like the institutional structures, learning from the community structures would be really critical if I wanted to pursue art at that professional level. Got it. Okay. And so you did that for a few years, I guess, while pursuing higher education. How did you end up, how did your focus shift from, you know, retail sales to community and impact driven organizations like Venture for Canada? Yeah. So I was at Westman for two years and it feels like I was there for way longer for some reason, but I was only there for, for two years. So my program was two years long. Um, and again, I thought of it as a dual career, right? So I was going to academia full-time, which is also community centered. It's research focused um, to have a job in academia. You're doing research and you are teaching. That is basically what a job in academia is. And then you're uh, you know, you could also see teaching as working with community, working with students, you're working with with the with a community that's formed at the institution. And then my other career was in retail sales. So I saw them as kind of two very different things. I had enough time for both. And so when I started teaching at Western, I really loved it. I really loved connecting with students. I really loved creating assignments. I did a certificate in teaching and learning uh, with the School of Advanced Studies while I was also doing my MFA. And so I um, wanted to pursue that a little bit more. I also created some assignments where I felt like I wasn't equipped to support my students in the both mental headspace and uh, community headspace that I wanted to. Um, professors teach in very different ways. Obviously, when you're teaching a studio course, professors tend to be a little bit more hands-on and or teaching tends to be a little bit more hands-on because you have smaller classrooms, smaller seminars, and you're doing work that is uh, really related to somebody's like ability to conceptualize something or um, their like technical skills. And so I decided I didn't know enough about education to start teaching or, or getting a teaching job. And so I moved to Toronto to do a second master's in adult education and community development at the University of Toronto. So my MED and higher ed and community development is part of the higher education and leadership faculty. And they cover a broad range of, of fields and um, uh, educational lenses. And this would have been around 2016. So a little bit after the Truth and Reconciliation Calls for Actions came out. And so I was really interested in, in working with um, Indigenous communities. I also had a student uh, in one of my courses that came out as transgender in the critique of uh, their artwork. And I also really wanted to understand how I could support students that were uh, experienced, experiencing adversity at the institutional level. And so moved to Toronto and did that master's part-time while I was still working in retail. So I worked at Aritzia still, um, in, on Bloor Street, and then I and I was doing my degree part time for for a bit before I kind of transferred over into the community space. I did have um, just luck, and uh, being in Toronto at a certain time, I had a lot of friends from my undergrad that started working in tech, and I had friends that. Uh, were really passionate about tech. So Shopify was coming up and well, Simple was coming up and Salesforce was hiring a lot of recent grads to go into sales development. And I had a friend who knew I had a ton of management experience from Aritzia and B2C sales experience. And um, they were working for a tech company and um, they knew that the tech company was hiring. And so I... Um, had the opportunity to get a job in tech for about a year uh, while I was also going to uh, grad school at U of T and I was still working at Aritzia part-time. But that kind of created my shift from retail to being, okay, I know I don't want to necessarily be in retail 
forever, even at the headquartered capacity. I knew I wanted to live in Toronto. I didn't want to move to Vancouver. I wanted to have a job where I could have my weekends back. And so um, tech felt like a really good space to be in Toronto in, in 2016, 2017. Um, from that job, I was also exposed to this whole new world of tech and um, the industry and what was happening within the tech sector and where work was shifting towards. And I came across uh, a lot of really cool people. And one of uh, one of my friends had just finished the first year of Venture for Canada's fellowship program. Oh, nice. And they said, you know, I think this is organization is really interesting. It's at the intersection of this tech space that you have a lot of critiques of because it <laughs> feels very bro -y and there's not a lot of equity, diversity, inclusion, but also you have your educational background. And um, at the time, I really felt like I was living in two worlds. I was living in like the academic U of T uh, world uh, in, in this faculty that was, I think, really advanced for its time and, and its thinking, and then the tech sector in Toronto. And so I found this organization that was uh, small at the time. It was about to to scale grow, and they actually had a job posting open um, for a social enterprise manager. I think that's what it was called when I applied. So it was somebody who was uh, looking to bring in revenue to a national charity um, that had an interest in social innovation. And I was just starting to get introduced into the concept of social innovation at the university level. And so I applied and, and that's how I got in. But it was really, you know, I see it as a very linear path of just saying yes to opportunities, keeping my eyes open, thinking about how I would marry my interest with my skill sets and just going for it when I had the chance to go for it. That's awesome. And I guess being friends with the right people too, because you were like introduced to this opportunity of Venture for Canada, right? Just by being connected to the right people. Um, yeah, definitely yeah. expanding my network and always, um, you know, ensuring that the people around me were also championing me regardless mm -hmm. of, you know, they, my friends don't really, your friends rarely know what you actually do for a job, right? Like they rarely... <laughs> understand what your day-to-day -day looks like especially once you graduate and you're all going in different directions yes. um but just having a really solid network from both queens and um western of people that new opportunities and are always like willing to to help one another was it the first time that you moved to toronto to pursue your um uh higher education degree at U of T because you said like you started at Ottawa and went to Western later on. Yeah. So I, so I went from Ottawa to Kingston to London, and nice. then I moved to Toronto for the first time to do my master's in adult education. Lots of different places. How did you adapt? Uh, I don't, I mean, they're not that different. <laughs> that's, a, <laughs> that's a nice thing. I mean, they're all within Ontario and Canada, uh, rarely, has um, a big shift. I would say earlier in my life when I moved around from Columbia to the US to Canada, like those were spaces where that required a lot of adaptation and um, understanding how to navigate different cultures and different languages. And I, I learned how to speak English when I was 10 years old. So um, I think having faced adversity early on in my life made me a really adaptable person. But Canada's, I mean, you're going from a smaller city to a bigger city. Um, and I'm a city person. So I didn't I didn't need much adapting once I got to Toronto. Yeah, it seems like it was your happy place to be in, right? Yeah. yeah okay, makes sense. Um, and so throughout these years, obviously, it wasn't a one night success. There were like things that happened, you know, initiatives that you took to to get to where you are today and i guess we'll be also talking about upside in the next part what kind of initiatives did you do or what kind of personal development investments in yourself did you do to get to where you are today 
Yeah. So, I mean, I would say all my schooling was a personal investment, right? Lifelong learning is so important for your career development. It's so important for your sense of, of worth, for your confidence. Um, so ongoing uh, education and not only, you know, at the institutional level, I also uh, took advantage of a course that BrainStation was offering women and it was uh, scholarship based and that was a professional development course that I took in digital marketing for 10 weeks um, being constantly uh, reading and um, participating in other workshops going to conferences has also been like really essential to to my personal growth and my and my professional growth um, so I would say lifelong learning, regardless of how you do it and how you engage with it is so important um, because our world is changing so fast that really staying in the know of what's happening, whether it's like, what are the latest tools that are being used? What are the digital skills that you need? How's our financial space changing? How can you um, have those really strong entrepreneurial skills is really helpful. Also, I mean, I worked in the entrepreneurial skills and, and leadership development space for five years, right? Designing Venture for Canada programs, uh, rebranding the organization. Um, and to do that, uh, while I had some expertise in that, I also sought out the best people that I could, you know, either pay or uh, be in touch with. Uh, within within my network to help me understand and grow in those areas. So leading Venture for Canada through a rebrand was one of the most exciting things that I'm reflecting on um, while while I was there. And I had an incredible group of of experts around me that supported that vision uh, from an agency that we worked with in Toronto called Hypnotic. And so. Um, Lifelong learning, surrounding yourself with experts. Um, Scott Stewart, who's the CEO of Venture for Canada, and I always talk about how, um, I don't know where he heard it from originally, but he said it to me. Or, and that's the first time kind of where I heard it, which is you're the average of the five people that you surround yourself with. And so in the workplace, surrounding yourself with people that you can learn from and um, can tap into their expertise. And then I would also say, um, I also really invested in my personal health. I think it's really something that isn't talked about when you're in school and you're a student. Um, the kind of hustle culture of doing really well, studying um, really late, sleeping at the library. I don't know if, if students do that anymore, but I, when I was in in school I remember being you know posting up at a desk at the library and like friends would rotate to watch each other's laptops and then you would maybe go get food but then you'd be there super super late and uh, you would go out on weekends and um, have a different schedule so I think investing in my health once I was able to build like a steady routine um, and had a schedule was was one of the best things that I could do for my career and to me, that investment in my health is really centered on uh, both like exercise. So having like a super active lifestyle and um, and just, you know, what what I what I eat and um, what I do in my free time. Got it. And investment in health is something I can do a lot better. In. It's something I got to learn how to invest in. Uh, one of the things I don't really there are lots of great things about Canada like I've grown so much since the, the four and a half years I've been here personally one of the things I don't like about the western culture is exactly what you said the hustle culture um I honestly I haven't seen people who successfully you know um found a way to not be trapped by that it's like everyone is just working super hard I've seen many people who slept at the library uh, I may have done that once or twice myself, but <laughs> and um, would you say you have been like successful to kind of navigating a routine to stay away from it and establish some sort of boundaries that allow you to be successful? 
I think it's, it's, I think it's hard at that age, right? Like, I think it's an age where like, it's, it's highly, com- or in that environment too, it's highly competitive. Um, it's high demand, high competition and high stakes. You're paying a lot of money to be in a place while you're earning very little money to eventually go out into the world and, and get a job or do something else or pursue, pursue something else. Um, And also you're building like your social community, you're building your network. I do think obviously Canadian North and North American culture in general. So us and us and Canada in particular, the higher education space operates really differently than most other countries in the world, you know, in other countries in the world to go into your career field, um, like here in Canada, for example, med school and law school are are not those are not graduate programs those those are called second entry bachelor programs and so it's just another bachelor's degree that you do but you have to have one that you've done beforehand that's what um like structurally they are whereas in most other places in the world like Europe and Latin America you go into you know your medical field profession right away it's a year longer but you don't have that second entry and the way that we're structured is to kind of gain like general knowledge and then go into specialized knowledge whereas other um you know other countries have it where you kind of just go right into that specialized knowledge um both have have their pros and cons but i think it's really tough to not put that kind of pressure on yourself but if you go equip or you start building those like really healthy habits at the time that you're in university, it's still, it's still a hustle. Like, I think we live in a really expensive country. Um, you have to, uh, you know, things are slowly shifting, but even in most industries that tend to be our traditional industries, like banking and accounting, um, investing, which was where a lot of business graduates go to, but also people in the arts, um, have demanding schedules, right? Like, no matter how much you hear about four day work weeks or uh, flex work, the reality is that most corporations are going back to in the office for four to five days a week uh, with some flexibility, but primarily you have to put in um, your 40 hours a week, right? That's yeah. The uh, way that our society works is with time and attention clauses. That's what they're called. So you get paid for your time and your attention. And that di- that requires, um, you know, a certain commitment instead of like outcomes, right? Like very yeah. few places pay by outcomes. Startups are different, but the majority of startups are are like two to 5% of our economy. Like they're very, very few. And, and very few between. of those pay for outcomes too. I exactly. Guess. Yeah. So very few, few of those and, and far in between. Um, but if you're going into our larger economic engines, like universities or hospitals, you're likely to, to have, um, you know, a schedule and a, and a commitment. And so investing in your, in your health from that small habit building is one of the best things you can do while you're a student. Perfect. And uh, remind me again, was it Spain that you did an exchange in? Like, was it? Yes. Exchange yeah. For... Okay. Could you like make a quick comparison between educational? Maybe like this is a good topic to bring up the hustle part of it. How different or similar was it to the Canadian education system? Yeah. So when I was in my second year of my undergrad, I did a full semester exchange uh, in Spain at the University of Salamanca, which is two hours west of um, Madrid, between um, Madrid and and Portugal border. And it's one of the oldest universities in Europe. It is an incredible place and a really renowned institution, but it was very different. The culture in in Salamanca, specifically for a lot of students that came from Erasmus, which is the European exchange program, um, it, it really varied. There's a lot more mature students that take undergraduate courses as well. Folks live with, with their families. Um, 
there's siesta, which means that you don't have courses between uh, 1 p.m. and 3 p.m. and everything in the city is closed. So it's not even like you are doing other things, but you are taking your siesta. I, I went to a gym. I found I found a gym that was open 24 hours a day. There was one in the city. And so during siesta time, because I wasn't used to it, I would go to the gym or I would go for a run. Um, but it is a little bit more every day. Yeah. <laughs> is, was that like nap time for some people? I guess. Yes. So, so yeah. siesta is, is nap time. Exactly. So it felt a little bit slower, but it also felt like people, uh, didn't need to consume as much, right? Nobody really had a car. Nobody was, uh, you could go out for it to eat. This also was like in 2012. So, um, you know, 10 years ago, you could go out to eat at a bar for two euros, like a euro beer and a euro tapa. And so this idea that you had to like work to make money to spend wasn't really as prevalent there. And and the Spanish also had a really bad recession um, at that time. And so it felt like people just, you know, were living a slower life and really appreciating education for for what it was not necessarily thinking of of making always making money to be spending more money i think i really gotta pay spain a visit that that would be an environment that i would thrive in <laughs> i haven't been in 10 years i mean i i, I haven't been since exchange i don't think so it might have changed i don't know if if it's still the same but i do hear comments often from you know folks in general that just like european life is a little bit less about consumption for consumption's sake yeah and it's just if it's less expensive like it's it's expensive to go out as a student like i don't know um how much it is to go out at a restaurant in london anymore but when i was there there was a really good greek place called cosmos that had just opened up and it was super affordable, right? Like you could go for like 10 to $12, but if prices have increased like everywhere else in Canada and you want to go for a nice meal and it's $30 every time, um, that could feel really expensive for some students. Yeah, no, it definitely has gotten a lot more expensive. I guess the answer to that question depends on the type of restaurant. Like if you want a shawarma meal, it would not be, it would be probably like $16 if you go get a whole combination uh, but if you're talking about a good fast food restaurant it could be upwards of 20 dollars like 20 or so dollars i would say yeah it's expensive um so kind of changing gears to your managerial role um obviously i've been a great person in advocating for opportunities for yourself what are your thoughts on people who come up with ideas and want to take it up to their managers like how how would you be appreciated how would you appreciate it if they brought up the ideas to you what way would you like it to be um so for me specifically that's you know that's one question I can answer but it's not something that is like a general like this is how you should take ideas to your managers because it really depends on um the culture that you're in, your manager in general, and the relationship you have with your manager. If you've been, if you, you know, if the question is like, if you have advice for young professionals in the workplace who are full of ideas and they want to be heard, how might they bring up those ideas to their managers? Um, And I, I think you have to consider those kind of three things. So the first is like, what is the culture of your workplace? Is there a system to bring up ideas? Um, you know, is there a Google Doc where people put like ideas to table, or do you have like a bike rack for like features ideas to discuss? Or is there a meeting that has like a free flowing space that's like a brainstorming meeting for future ideas that everybody's invited to? Obviously, if those are the, if that's a space that you're in, then that like the answer is very clear. Like follow the system right? Like there's been something implemented in place, probably for a reason because of previous experiences that the organization or company has had in 
an idea, brainstorming, surfacing. And so just like, if there's a process, follow it. If there's not a process uh, and you're facing barriers in bringing up ideas to your manager, I think you ask if there's like a way, like what is the, as asking your manager, hey, I have an idea. What is the best way that I could propose it? Um, Is it timely? Like, is it, you know, is this a timely thing or is this like a future forward idea? Um, Does it align with your organization's quarterly priorities? And if it does, then that makes it timely. So really be strategic about what ideas you propose. Ideas are a dime a dozen. I actually, um, you know, to me, an idea is irrelevant um, because the idea is not necessarily what is valuable. It's how you're going to execute it and how it's going to add to the existing business objectives. So everybody has ideas. Everybody steals ideas. There's multitudes of ideas. Uh, If you've had an idea, somebody else has probably had it at the organization. And so I think being really strategic about not making those assumptions that like ideas, your ideas are really valuable and that your ideas are a priority for whatever reason. Um, And so if I were to have advice for a student or a recent grad who felt like they had a lot of good ideas, wasn't necessarily being heard or being able to surface them was to go back and say, how do these ideas align to the objectives that have been laid out by the organization or the company? How do they align to your objectives and your tasks? Because you might have a really good idea, but you might actually be the best person to execute it as well. And so I think you need to think about if you are If you want to execute the idea, does it align with your job description? Does it align with what you're supposed to be doing? If you just want the idea to be implemented, how do you shop that idea around? So, you know, plant that seed in somebody else's head so that they can execute the idea. So I think, what are the systems? There's no systems. Are you the best person? Is it timely and is it relevant? And do you, are you the best person to deliver it? And if you're not, plant the seed towards somebody else who is the best person to deliver it. And if you are, or if, if you just don't want that, then probably not worth bringing it up. Got it. No, I, I really liked the, the response to that. I also like the organizational quarterly priorities. I think that's a big one. So if you can find a link to kind of connect them uh, somehow, then this would be so much more impactful than just bringing up an idea for the sake of doing that. Um, One of the things I realized is painting a picture for people to see how one thing could become so much better or what are the current pain points is really helpful and how implementing an idea can like help propel towards something better or improve an existing problem. That's one of the things I've learned. Um, The other thing is when you have buy-in from the team members, like give them some sort of ownership over I don't know participation or like decision making it kind of pulls them in as well so now they're invested in that. at the start they may yeah. not have liked it but now they're also invested in the idea yeah exactly like is your idea totally left field and if it's relevant to like enhance or improve something how do you also enhance your idea by getting others input into it so that becomes like a collective idea instead of feeling ownership or a sense of propriety like proprietation over that improvement and i guess uh since we're talking about you know the workplace it might be a good time to dive into our hot takes for this week and the question is is it a good idea for people early in their careers to job hop What's your take on that? Oh, okay. So, I mean, I um, don't have experience job hopping. Um, I was at Aritzia for over nine years. I was at a startup for a full year, but I didn't really hop from that job. I felt like I was there for a long time. And then I was at Venture for Canada for just about five years. Um, And now I'm, I'm not early in my career so even if I were to go somewhere else soon after upside after the upside foundation which I don't plan on um I don't have experience in it 
What I do have experience though is hiring a lot of young people, interviewing a lot of young people for for venture for Canada's programs, and talking to a lot of startup founders about the people that they bring onto their teams. Um, I it matters to a certain extent when you're in a place where you've been around the workforce enough. So does it matter when you're in your 40s and 50s or even when you're 35 plus? No, that's not, it's not going to matter once you reach a certain level or a certain time of being in the workforce. Mostly because you probably won't name those first couple of jobs that you've had. Um, and also because nobody goes back that far in your career history, right? So when you've been in the workforce for 10 years, they're not going to look at the first five years of your career. They're going to look at year five to year 10, right? When you have been in your career for only about, or in, in the workforce for only five years, and you've had 10 different jobs, that's when it'll start to matter. So to get into that like next phase, it's when it'll start to matter. Um, and even when you get past like job hop three to four to five, that's going to be where people start to say, okay, well, have you been in a place, have you been around enough to even get anything done? You might've felt like you've learned, you might've felt like you deserve more, but like, what did you actually achieve? And a point of return for a company at the leadership level or like at the management level is six to nine months. So that means that they don't expect actual returns for six to nine months made up based on the investment that they've made on hiring you. If you've left a job before nine months, have you achieved any outcomes that have been set out that actually move the needle forward in the business? Maybe if the company is really early stage and you get to wear a lot of hats and you move really fast and it's the kind of job where three years feels like, you know, th or three months feels like a year, but if you've barely gotten ramped up, then it's going to tell by the way that you talk about outcomes. So it depends on you, what, you know, what you think a good idea is. Um, it's not a bad thing to do if you want to try new things, if you know how to talk about the story of your jobs, if you want to make more money and aren't getting paid enough, if you just don't like your workplace and it's toxic and you need to leave, it's obviously a good idea if the if it's the right reason. Yeah. It's not necessarily a good idea if you're just doing the same job at different organizations because of an increase in pay. That was an awesome take. A very decision, what do you call it? Decision informed. Uh, a very well researched answer. Let's say, let's say that. Yeah, uh, my take is similar to yours. I guess, like from a compensation standpoint, though, it always kind of makes sense to job hop just solely on the compensation part. But there was this video I was watching from the uh, speaker Simon Sinek, who mm -hmm. was saying, "Well, if you leave a job in less than a year or like six months, then the question is, um, companies go through cycles, right? Like, I guess they are not always performing best. If you do that multiple times, then the question becomes, are you able to weather the storm when the time comes or not? Because, you know, the first six months could have been awesome, but then something happened that led to leaving." And no, I'm not talking about to toxic environments. Like we, I think we established that you you got to stay away from those environments. But like when the job becomes difficult or when the stakes are high, what do you decide? And I think kind of building on off of your point, this is what ends up painting a picture for the next employer or people you're talking to. You can always say, oh, we had a very difficult time during this period. But instead of leaving, I kind of stepped up wore so many different hats and here's what I achieved and here's what I'm looking forward to do. Um, that's yeah. my take based on what I know now. Yeah, def I mean, I also think you have to consider like, are you getting paid in equity, right? Like, especially if you work for a startup, like when is when do those options best? Like, do you have to stay for a certain amount of time for it to actually pay off and to have a sense of, of ownership? Like, what are you actually leaving for? 
and um, being able to make an informed decision is what matters most early in your career, like being able to go back to that decision and for it to be like, this is a decision I stand by. If it's like for a, you know, 5k increase, I think that also could be like, are you good at having difficult conversations? Could you go to your manager and say, Hey, there's this other job. I have an offer. The only reason why I would leave is because of this like slight increase. Is this something that you're willing to match? And if you're able to, you know, if you have that conversation, they're like, yeah, no, we don't think you're worth that much. Then like, great. Like, you know why, but I think it's also understanding like, why are you leaving? Can you have tough conversations and can you um, leverage the opportunity to job hop to you, your advantage? The interesting thing I've heard though, about like going to your manager and saying that is again, this is hearsay, usually ends up in the case where gosh, what do they call it? Your concern of flight risk? Where like they would they would like be viewing you as someone who's going to be leaving. If not today, then like the next six months, I guess. Everyone leaves their job. Unless you, you know, <laughs> like most, and your manager's probably also going to leave your job. I think when somebody's considered, uh, I mean, if, if you use that tactic every year, then that is not you know then you're just going to become a person who's who their organization might feel hostage right um but if you do feel like there's growth opportunities and you do want to stay there and the only reason why you would leave is for a small increase i think that comes off very genuine right to say like i love it here and like also if you are showing results like if you're performing well and if you are part of the organizational culture and you believe in it that comes through like results speak for everything. If you're just not meeting results and you try to do that, yeah, you're going to be seen as a flight risk and they're all probably not going to care that you're a flight risk. Got it. So it's about results. Yeah. I guess I, I would personally frame it as a, a way that, Hey, I want to stay with this company for a long time. Like these are my thoughts. And there's always lessons and points about how to bring up negotiation strategies, right? How to bring up, the point of, okay, the market value for, for my role has increased. The scope of responsibilities have like massively changed from what I was hired to like a lot of, a lot of points that we could talk about. Yeah. You could even ask like, but if, I mean, just because your market, you the, your market rate, rate has increased. It doesn't mean that that's the compensation philosophy that your company matches, right? Like your company might have a compensation philosophy that is like, we pay everyone with in the 50th percentile and if you're still within that 50th percentile but you're looking at data that is showing the 60th to 70th percentile it doesn't like align with the organization or company's compensation philosophy so really understanding what their compensation philosophy is and asking and if they're like oh we don't have one then that should tell you you know then then if they don't have one then like that's something that you could contribute to saying like it'd be really great to build this but most companies have a compensation philosophy got it yeah this is a point i missed that was a good one thanks for mentioning it compensation philosophy okay and um so one quick thing here given your um, experience of working with today's founders i guess it's a good chance to like, kind of give an introduction about what you do at upside and um, how you see the person of today's founders yeah, so I'm really privileged to work with founders from across Canadian companies um, that allocate equity to the Upside Foundation of Canada so that when they have a big exit, whether that's an IPO or an acquisition or, or a merger, uh, that equity is exercised and then we work with the founders to, to flow that through to charities across Canada that ideally align with their company's pillars, mission and values. Um, and in the process, I get to work with founders uh, leading different programming from professional development programming to philanthropic um, uh, knowledge forming uh, programming. So I get to work with a very specific type of founder because the founder that I get to work with is already a little bit forward thinking. 
they understand that what they're building is for something larger than themselves. But that's also the persona that I think most Canadian founders have. There's really very little room for altruism in in this space. Most founders aren't that like, uh, you know, uh, persona like persona that we see on Netflix of the founder who really wants to make a lot of money and is is willing to do whatever it takes to get there but they're rather really methodical and um they take risk but they take calculated risk they are really empathetic and lead with empathy to build really strong teams that are going to get them ahead um and they're really focused on being resourceful so i would say some of kind of like the persona of the founders that I get to to speak with is resource like a resourceful person, really not afraid to build partnerships, not afraid to ask for what they want, not afraid to find different ways of doing things if it's not working out. The second is is they are willing to take risk and they're willing to take risks that are also calculated. And so um, they are very very intentional with their time and where they're willing to, um, you know, put more of, of a, of a risk mind, what they're willing to put on the table, um, and where they're willing to take risk. And I would say, um, the third one is they're just a little bit forward thinking and and future thinking. So it's about building something that's going to last, that's going to, um, be a viable business that's going to have returns for themselves and their investors. And that's actually going to make a dent in in solving a problem that we're facing. And um, kind of to follow up on the building partnerships part, um, people go in with the mindset of what they want, right? Um, Okay, if we do this partnership, these are the things that I want how how is the thinking for two organizations that are trying to build a partnership do they get everything that they both sides want or i'm guessing compromise happens somewhere but how do you determine what's the best case scenario what's the least case scenario what do i want you know what i'm talking about like the the points yeah i, I think i, I get where you I get what you're saying. I would actually disagree. Um, when you're a, you know, partnership professional, once you've had a pretty long career in partnerships, you know that it's not about what what you want. I think like potentially that could be a really good point actually to like demystify. Like, is a partnerships role about getting what you want? Um, and maybe when you're like young and early in your career, you think that partnerships about like getting what you want, but ultimately partnership roles are about adding mutual benefit. And it might not necessarily be what you want, but probably going with the focus on like, this is what's needed for us to invest in this partnership. And these are the outcomes that we will have to show for, but how can we make this mutually beneficial? And so I would say, you know, as a partnerships professional, I never go in thinking about like, this is what I want. It's like, what do we have in common? What is our common interest? What are our common goals? And how is there mutual benefit in building a partnership? Great. Once those are checked off to make this partnership happen, what is needed is, uh, you know, whether it's like financial investment or um network support or time whatever it is that's needed to to make the partnership happen and to go okay can we meet those needs yes and then does this get us to the results that we want but that's kind of like the last thing that i would say in the partnership like oh but i want if i go into partnership being like this is what i want from you (laughs) i'm not gonna get anything yeah mutual benefit love it so but then like when you think about mutual benefits though isn't it representing what your organization wants or how do you even think about that i think um, that's that's what makes partnership a such high paying job because it's it's not easy you got to figure out a solution or as you said a mutual benefit for both sides yeah i would say again like w- when you say what your organization or company wants like does that go back to the goals and objectives like are you saying like or cuz we might want to be 
known as the philanthropic agent for all the tech sector. That's a want, but that's I don't really need, yeah. you know, I don't really need that. Like we don't actually like, that's like a high level vision want, but can I meet my goals and operate this organization without achieving that? Yes. So when do you know how to reach for what you want versus what you need and what's methodical and what makes sense? And also what is needed in the ecosystem or what is needed in the space? So if you're talking about um, like your organization might want to change a policy, but if there's no lobbying or consensus around changing that policy, it doesn't matter that you want it. So what I, what I think I'm trying to get to is that what you want doesn't really matter. Wanting something doesn't really matter if it doesn't align with what is needed or what there's consensus around. So do you want a hundred million dollars of annual recurring revenue, or is that what you need to be able to operate and be able to, to show to your stakeholders and investors? Are you fine if you do nine instead of 11? If the answer is yes, then what? why push towards what you want versus like building something that makes sense? Okay, interesting. And I'm hearing a lot of these for the first time. I guess my kind of mindset is coming from the sales-focused roles where at least the the way I was learning about sales is kind of achieve, hitting quota, you know, achieving goals, closing deals. But it does it does really make sense when you like put it in that way. Yeah, um, and and I mean, if that's yeah. if that's goals and quota are probably set by your revenue leaders as what is, you know, a minimum and maximum, like what is needed and then what is, what would be above and beyond, right? So like quota is going, like if you meet your quota, that's going like what the company is going above and beyond. Because if quota was your minimum, then it wouldn't be, you know, then it wouldn't be quota. Then, then if everybody's working towards their minimum, then that means that, you're not going to meet your actual like operating, you know, goals. So for me, it's more around the word, like to me, the word want in business is, is, it's really visionary. Like we want to do this great that we want to do this, but how do we do this? What, what metrics are needed to get there? And it's not about like, to me, a want is like a desire for something versus like a a need or a task or a must is like a requirement. And to me, a want is never a requirement. It's like, what is mission critical? And if it's mission critical, then it's a requirement. So partnerships can have requirements. And you can be like, for me to be able to build this partnership, it requires that you pay $10,000. That's non-negotiable. But it doesn't mean that it's part of the you know, that's ultimately not what you want as a salesperson. It's like you want there to be mutual benefit because if you do a partnership, the requirements that they pay $10,000, but then they don't get anything out of it or they don't like the service and they're not going to renew next year. And so that doesn't matter because ideally what you want in a customer is a recurring annual customer for many years that's going to increase their usage. And so I think a re- meeting a requirement you go into a partnership understanding the requirements, right? So that's not something that's on the table to build mutual benefit. You know, the requirement for people to partner with Upside as patrons or sponsors is financial. It's not, it's what I, it, it's obviously something yeah. that I need. What I want though, and what's, you know, that was that we build something together. What I'm getting from a mutual benefit is that we work on a few events together. So it's kind of yeah. breaking it down into that. Yeah, no, I, I love the distinction between the requirement versus the want versus the mutual benefit. That was awesome. Gave me some ideas to consider thinking about partnerships, I guess. Talk to more prof- more um partnership professionals now. <laughs> Seems very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes <laughs> sometimes like 
it's it's the it's the you know it's like to get through the door you're required to do something right like yeah. uh if you think about it from uh like in a partnership standpoint um if you're building a partnership with you know if the if your podcast is building a partnership with a another subgroup right so let's say you're saying we're going to do uh voices of western with uh, previous Olympic athletes who also are Western athletes and you partner with, um, you know, the Canadian Olympic association, you know, that, that would be like a really, you know, possible partnership for you. And, but you're saying the requirement for us to partner is that we have at least 10 guests right? Like that's just yeah. a minimal requirement for you to put your time and effort into that partnership. If they say we can't meet that requirement, you don't pursue the conversation, right? Like you're not going to partner for one guest, then that's not a partnership. Then you're just because inviting no somebody. Benefit. Exactly. Yeah. But if they say, okay, we can meet that now, how do we actually make this mutually beneficial for both of us? Oh, let's maybe have a co-host. Oh, let's think about how we co-promote it. Oh, um, Let's create one question that we ask all of the people together. Let's see if we can find a sponsor and we split that sponsorship between both organizations. That's a partnership. Awesome. Perfect. And uh, I guess one last question as we are wrapping up this episode is what is one thing you hope our listeners take away from this amazing conversation that we had? Oh my gosh. Um, just that you can really try multiple things. And as long as you take the confidence to own your story and the decisions that you've made, you will be able to pursue that next thing. Uh, I would say emotional intelligence and the ability to concisely communicate are two of the most important skills to have in the workforce and finding ways to grow those and exercise those is very important as we go into a very digital and knowledge-based economy. Love it. Concise communication. That's one of the things I'm actually working on to like articulating my points in a certain way. That's a really hard skill. That's a tough skill. But thank you for bringing that up. And thank you to our listeners for tuning in to another episode of Voices of Western. Hope you have a great rest of your day. Feel free to follow us on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, LinkedIn recently. We're everywhere. Uh, Juanita, any, any final words? Thank you for having me and good luck with everything. Awesome. Well, thank you so much and have a good day.